This is Cape Town, South Africa. Here on Robben Island in this bay, Nelson Mandela served most of his 27 years in prison. He was kept with other ASC leaders, among them Walter Sisulu and Gavan Becky. Robben Island, seven miles out to sea, is the Alcatraz of South Africa. For years, Mandela crushed stones within sight of Table Mountain, one of the most beautiful spots on Earth. When Mandela was set free, I wondered what his response to freedom would be. He'd become a byword for prisoners of conscience, but the world knew little of the man. The last picture of him had been taken over a quarter of a century ago. Nobody knew what he really looked like. Mandela had no face. It would have been enough to have survived 27 and a half years imprisonment with one's sanity intact and one's bodily vigor so unimpaired. But Mandela seemed to possess more than a sound mind and a healthy body. I thought it remarkable that he seemed to show no bitterness toward his tormentors. He seemed a man in a hurry to build a new society who had no time for rancor. Nelson Mandela is one of a very few liberating leaders who inspires hope rather than fear. It was this quality that intrigued me enough to wish to meet him and try to learn the roots of his nearly unique behavior under such terrible circumstances. I met him in Soweto, where he lives now. Sadly, our conversation took place against a background of terrible violence. The night before we met, nine people had been killed in a neighboring township, and by the end of the week, the death toll was in the hundreds. He had slept two hours the previous night, trying to stop the violence that was threatening to fragment the country's black population. By the end of that week, 8,000 people would be made homeless I had not come as a professional reporter, but I thought I might talk to Mandela as a man who was formed, as we all are, by his inheritance and his time. He's a political man, so politics would have to have its place in such a conversation. But my interest was in illuminating some of the personal forces that shaped his character and his views. I would like to uh, look back on your life I'd like to go back to uh, the beginning in Transkei, to your family and your early life and your youth. What sort of place was Transkei? Well, my father and mother were completely illiterate. None of them had ever been to school. Fortunately, my father was a chief. He belonged to the real house of Timberland. And to that extent, they were the focus of attention in my village. And also my father occupied a position equivalent to that of prime minister in the tribe. I grew up in that atmosphere where tribal meetings used to be held from time to time and where I had uh, the opportunity of uh, coming into contact with the men who influenced the policy uh, of the tribe. And uh, I learned uh, from them about uh, African heroes. It was not uh, the type of lesson which uh, we get from school, 
scientific in the sense that uh, conclusions uh, must be based on facts. There was a great deal of legend around it. And uh, to me as a child, the trans guy was the center of the entire world. Then uh, the trans guy prided itself as being an extension of the British Empire where the sun never set. Yes. <clears throat> We ourselves are used to sing songs to that effect. And uh, even when I went uh, to varsity and uh, when the war broke out in 1939, we were completely on the side of Great Britain. Not so much because uh, we appreciated that uh, they had a more democratic system as against the autocracy of Nazism. But because the British Empire was threatened and we felt, you know, as uh, the loyal subjects of uh, the British monarch. Was there any contact with white people uh, or was it just the, the official? Well, uh, the contact was very slender indeed because the whites with whom we came into contact was uh, the village trader, uh, the magistrate, the man in charge of uh, the dipping tank, and the policeman. Yeah. And uh, they were not only a distance away from us, they were <clears throat> uh, something like uh, superhuman beings. But fundamentally they... Very little contact with them. Fundamentally they didn't bother you. Well, <clears throat> if you mean that uh, they wielded no shambles, yes, they didn't. But uh, they lauded it over yeah. uh, the country. When a magistrate came for a meeting, for example, both the chiefs and ordinary tribesmen had to stand up and greet him uh, on uh, their feet. He was somebody like a super chief. The trader also received a similar status. Uh, he was respected by the tribe and uh, he was not one of them. He was somebody uh, in authority and was very conscious you know, of his superior position. <clears throat> the missionary also, I, they tried, the missionaries tried uh, to destroy belief in custom and, uh, and they created uh, the, the perception that uh, we had no history, we had no culture. Especially at school, uh, the idea was to develop us as a second class whites uh, who learned uh, by root what the capitalists or capitals of the world were. Uh, the men who made history were kings and queens, uh, generals and not the masses of the people themselves. Now, under those circumstances, what kind of future could you imagine for yourself? Well, uh, I think it would be inappropriate to talk of a future to a country boy of that age. Uh, because uh, the future, one judged merely from the point of view of the concept prevailing in the countryside, and the concept there, at least um, uh, during my childhood, was that uh, you should be rich in, uh, in cattle and sheep, right. and uh, you should also be rich in wives, because my father was a polygamist. He had four wives. And uh, that was the concept which one had 
in his childhood. Uh, to think in terms of the future, uh, to think of the future in terms of a profession like medicine, like a doctor, was something completely strange. And for quite some time after I had been to school, I had really no idea as to what I would be in life. And I suppose uh, that uh, this was the experience of almost every young man of my age. Um, <clears throat> when I was uh, under 16, there was a tendency to want uh, to emulate the whites themselves. <clears throat> but of course, from school, we went back uh, to our own village where the force of custom there was too strong for us to resist. And uh, so that uh, you had a dual approach. On the one hand, you were influenced, you see, by the customs of the tribe. And that is why one wanted uh, to be rich in uh, stock, livestock. At the same time, when you went to school, you were then exposed to a different environment. And uh, you sincerely felt that I wanted to be like that white man, the magistrate. But these were very vague concepts, uh, conflicting, and not really well thought out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about your understanding of the Afrikaner. I mean, did you regard the Afrikaner, for example, as different from the English background? Yes, no, that's the crucial, uh, it's a very crucial question, a very important yeah. question. Because uh, from the point of view of uh, policy, the Africaners have not differed very much from the English. Some of the most conservative elements in the country have been English speaking. And uh, who have uh, denied us uh, basic human rights. But uh, the English have a certain sophistication and uh, and secondly, they have realized the value of uh, making education, educational opportunities available uh, to Africans. You must remember that uh, the first schools in the country in which we were trained, were educated, were missionary schools. The Africana also believed in uh, uh, racial separation, but they were very crude about it and uh, very brutal. They are an extremely religious family, in theory, although they don't practice what they preach, because uh, they go to church and, uh, and then uh, continue to oppress the blacks. They won't allow, there is no equality uh, to, between black and white uh, in church or state. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, to use an expression uh, in a different way, which was uh, uh, used uh, by uh, one of uh, the later African leaders, uh, Arab Moy, he said one day, there are no VIPs in heaven. But I believe that the Africaners believe that uh, there, are, there are VIPs in, in heaven themselves. But I don't believe personally that uh, there is any group of people who have got such a culture that they are impervious to change. It is because of lack of contact. Because in prison, we have met uh, the most hardened uh, group of Africaners, warders functioning behind prison walls. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no place like prison which will tell you how the country the, the policy of yeah. the country than sure. prison. But uh, we have had, we have had changed the people, the Africaners, uh, who were hostile when we came, 
But as a result of contact and conversations, they discovered that uh, now these are human beings and what they have been taught uh, was totally wrong. And they have been working with us. Uh, you decided to study law in the early 40s, wasn't it? 1942, I think. Yeah. Uh, what led to that decision rather than some other career? It may well be that uh, one of my senior uh, relatives had done a legal BA at Forte. And although we subsequently became a bitter political enemies, although we were always on good terms as individuals, we subsequently became bitter political enemies. But at one time, he influenced me tremendously. And it may well be that it was because of my admiration for him that influenced me to follow a legal career. You know, uh, more than once you seem to separate a man's political position from his character and his nature, which is a very unusual capacity in people. Usually we get to hate people we disagree with, but you don't seem to do that. Well, it is possible that uh, my experiences in prison influence me in this direction. It is uh, assumed that uh, every warder uh, in prison was a cruel man who believed in persecuting a black a prisoners. As a general rule, this was the case. But uh, amongst them, there were men, there were good men, and they uh, would did everything within the framework of uh, the policy, uh, the practice of the prison, who did everything to make our condition as comfortable as possible. Some of them would uh, give us newspapers. So they became your friends, one or two? Friends, became yeah. very, very good friends. And yeah. we also learned uh, to uh, befriend a warder in charge of the section. Because in many cases, he is more important than the commissioner of prisons. Yeah. Because if you went to the commissioner of prisons, and even to the minister of justice, and you said, it is very cold, I want four blankets. You will look at the regulations and say, no, the regulations say that in winter, you must have three blankets, not four. I can't give you four blankets. But if you went to the warder in charge of your section, and you say, I want uh, four blankets. He just goes to the storeroom and gives it to you, right. if you're friendly with him. And uh, when the authorities wanted to have a carry-on, as we call it in prison, when they want to be hard on you for one reason or other, they ask the warders in the section to be hard. But if you are friendly to a warder, you won't do so. He will tell you that, uh, well, I'm expected to do this. I must, I'm expected to treat you harshly. And uh, then you are able to adjust yourself. And uh, that experience may have uh, uh, influenced me in this direction. But uh, it is always of advantage to draw a distinction between general policy and the people who carry out that policy because there are very good men amongst them. You did practice law for a time. I did. Yeah. And I sent many people to jail. You sent many people to jail. <laughs> I hope uh, correctly. Uh, when did you, uh, when, did, when you became uh, an activist, when was that? 1944 to be exact. 44, and what was that occasion? 
Well, the occasion was the formation of the African National Congress Youth League. The Youth League, I see. Yes. <coughs> and uh, I was one of the founders, although, of course, there were people more experienced than myself, mm -hmm. uh, on whom I really relied. Right. But uh, I was among the foundation members of the NC. Right. Now, in those days, the, the few white people were of help to you, is that right? Yes. And, 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 and the communists were among them. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, it was a real experience, uh, my coming to Johannesburg, because up to college at Hilltown and Forte, Europeans uh, were far removed, right, a distance away from us. We rarely met them in class. There was no social contact between us. And uh, this um, uh, image of whites uh, being superior was very uh, evident uh, in our college and uh, at Forte. And uh, there was no contact whatsoever. But when I came to Johannesburg in 1941, I came across whites in the Communist Party. I see. And uh, whose attitude was totally different. And uh, I remember a case when um, a uh, clerk in my firm asked me to go to a party in the evening. And uh, I met a white chap, you know, with uh, an open uh, neck shirt. And uh, he was not uh, particularly impressive in his appearance. And I had a conversation with him, and I was very tense, because I was not used, you know, to be in a party with whites. I was very tense. But uh, he, I had a chat with him, and I think he was aware of my background and my problems. And subsequently, I asked from my friend who took me there, now, uh, who is this chap? And he told me that he was an M.A. in English. I had to, to undergo an intellectual metamorphosis because I couldn't imagine a person who is an M.A. going to a party, you know, without a tie, you know. And uh, his appearance also did not appear to me to be that of a graduate because we had been taught at uh, college and at Forte that um, if you have a degree, then you're automatically a leader and you must be exemplary in everything that you do in your dress, outside appearances. You have a, a degree, you have to wear a tie. Yes, that's right. right. <laughs> uh, so I made contact, you know, with whites uh, in the party. But the whole idea of... Like Michael Hamel and uh, Rusty Benston. Yeah. Rusty Benston was a wonderful chap. Yeah, in fact, he's still alive. Yeah. He's a wonderful chap. But the, the idea of Marxism, how, what influence did that have on your thinking? It did have an influence, but I never joined the party. Yeah. And, uh, but... Uh, approaching, analyzing society from the point of view of those of the poor, of the workers, of the disadvantaged, we could easily identify it, you know, with its central theme. Yes. But of course, uh, the fact that uh, I was brought up uh, in the royal house uh, where with a great deal of difficulty I became convinced in nationalism, and uh, I had a degree of national pride. And of course, at the very nature of the ANC, which is a broad national movement, appealing to all political groups, it soon became evident to me that if you are going to exercise an impact on the organization as a whole, and on the people who form its membership, then you must be avoid being associated, identified with a political party. I see. What uh, particularly made you go underground when 
you did? Well, uh, it was uh, really a response uh, to instructions which were given to me by the leadership of the organization. That is the simple fact. Yeah. I had uh, recently married and uh, I wanted uh, to remain with my wife and my family. This was what year? This was, I went underground in April 1961. 61. And I had got married in 58. I see. And uh, I had a very young children, a uh, young wife, and uh, I was anxious, you know, to uh, give her uh, the security, the dignity, and the love to which uh, uh, she is entitled. But uh, the instruction came from the leadership that uh, I must go underground and organize now uh, resistance against the government, uh, the armed struggle in particular. And I obeyed that. And uh, I myself had always felt, of course, that uh, we had reached a stage where we have to consider uh, some alternative because the government had made it impossible for us to continue our policy as of old a non-violent, disciplined, and peaceful, peaceful struggle. Yeah. They had closed all channels of communication, and it was necessary for us. Tell me, was uh, there... CETA, an alternative um, uh, means of political uh, struggle. T tell me, was there an influence of Gandhi in the original impulse? Oh, the influence of Gandhi in our politics, in our methods of political action, yeah. has been quite a formidable. You must remember that um, as from 47, we worked very closely with uh, the Indian Congress in the country. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, they were influenced by the policy of nonviolence of Mahatma Gandhi. Right. They had launched uh, the passive resistance campaign in 1946, in which uh, practically uh, every Indian family in the country went to prison. Was it a, a real wrench for you to have to start organizing a military force? Philosophically, I mean. Well, we had been brought up in the tradition of nonviolence and peaceful struggle. Yeah. And uh, this was a very difficult decision, but uh, it was dictated by objective conditions. Yeah. We realized that uh, we either had to capitulate or to stand up and fight, and we chose the latter. And uh, to that extent, uh, we were able to adjust uh, from uh, a struggle which was based on non-violence to that which was uh, now, uh, which was based on the use of force. Mm -hmm. So you had to travel abroad and learn how to be a soldier yourself? Yes, I trained in Ethiopia and Algeria, and uh, I visited a number of states to explain the new policy and ask for support. And um, uh, we worked together with the other comrades in the movement uh, to establish this organization. But I was underground, and they were working with me from above ground. Right. So where did you live when you were underground? in various places. All over the place? I uh, had uh, all over the place. I had uh, quite a number of... Uh, but you were in and out of, of, of Johannesburg? Yes, no, I lived in Johannesburg, I lived in Durban, I lived in Cape Town. Right. Yes. I've, I've heard stories that the CIA turned you in. Well, I do not know about that. I'm not so sure. Because I had no contact with uh, anybody whom I regarded as a member of the CIA. I returned from abroad and then I wanted to report to Lutuli that I was back. And uh, then I met a number of uh, committees in Durban, executive committee of the ANC, of the Indian Congress, 
uh, the regional committee of Mkonde was seized in Durban. Uh, now, and I suspect that I had actually overstepped, ignored the security. It was necessary for me to brief uh, these committees, mm -hmm. but uh, I should perhaps have confined myself only to a small group. I and I think that was really the mistake. Uh, they soon knew that I was in Durban. Right. And then uh, they put roadblocks in all outlets from, John, from Durban. And that is how I was caught. Can you recall the day when you uh, first uh, stepped onto Robben Island uh, with a life sentence in front of you? I remember that day very well. They woke us up at midnight. That is the day when a judgment was given. They woke us up at midnight and told us that we were being flown to a place where we would have perfect freedom within, behind prison walls. And that turned out to be Roman Island. Oh, they didn't tell you it was actually Robin Island? No, no, no. Why was that? I think it is for security. And uh, security considerations, you know, can uh, uh, go to a very unreasonable extent. Mm -hmm. They told us, you see, when we were close to the island. And uh, they took us there uh, in an uh, army trooper, army plane. And the investigating officer told us that your fellows will not stay in prison for five years. You will be there for less than five years. There is such a strong demand for your release that the government can never resist it. Within five years, you will be released. And you will come back as heroes with everybody wanting your friendship. This was an officer who was telling you this? This was an investigating officer. Investigating officer. Did you believe him? Well, uh, we hoped he was right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the temptation to believe him was very strong. Sure. Because indeed, there were demands uh, all over the world. Yeah. By heads of states, heads of governments, of parliaments, what were the conditions at first? You, were you put in a cell by yourself or were there others? Were you all together? Well, we were in separate cells. Each one has his own cell. And a very small cell. You could hardly do any exercise there. It was so small. Were you there day and night in that cell? Yes, uh, because for some time, uh, they did not even allow us to exercise. But uh, after we had uh, brought pressure to bear on them, they allowed us to go out and to crush the stones. Yeah. And uh, it was a very terrible time because uh, Robben Island uh, could be very cold. Yeah. And they uh, we were very scantily dressed without underwear. And uh, that cold, you know, would go right into our marrows. And uh, we had a hard time in it from the first. Now, how long were you cr uh, doing hard labor? Well, uh, we did hard labor from uh, the time we reached the island up until about 72. Uh, until you were? 72. Oh, really? For eight years. So at what point, <clears throat> now you, could you be in touch with your wife or not? Well, at first, uh, my wife uh, saw me every six months. That was what was just permitted one visit a year? Yes, of 30 minutes. 30 minutes. For well, once was, a month. was there a glass between you? Yes, there was a partition. And um, 
and you are also supposed to write and receive one letter every six months. That was the original position. At that time you had two children? No. I had, uh, when I was convicted, I had five children. You had five? Three from my first wife yeah. and two from my second wife. So you would never see them until they were teenagers, isn't that right? Well, uh, you could see them uh, after two years. And then from then until they turned 16. So at what point did you begin to realize that this five-year sentence was not going to happen? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, when I was in prison, uh, and when the agitation died down, and uh, when uh, the uh, government spokesman stressed that our policy is that a man who has been sentenced to life imprisonment should serve for the rest of his life. Life meant life. And uh, it became clear that uh, we would be released uh, not because the government wanted us to be released. It would be mass pressure on the part of our people. And that wasn't there sufficiently? Well, at that time, there was a time when uh, the government had succeeded in so disrupting the movement that uh, there was not much agitation outside, except, of course, among white students. In the English universities, they came all out uh, to oppose uh, these harsh measures. Not only that, they were vitally interested to see the welfare of the prisoners themselves. They organized funds for us to study, and they provided us uh, with reading material. And uh, now that uh, black students uh, also you know, have come up and they tended to be dominating because of their numbers, and, uh, and of course because of their militancy, people tend to forget the contribution that was made by the National Union of South African Students, uh -huh. which is a white organization. So were you able to get uh, reading matter in and out, newspapers and so on? Oh, no, no, no. For quite some time, you see, we didn't uh, for some have years? newspapers. Quite for, for quite some years. We only got papers about uh, 72. So. What was your feeling about the outside world? And you look out the window and you could see Cape Town. No, but uh, we had uh, our own means of informing ourselves. What was that? How, how could you do well, that? Well, uh, we had, uh, in the first place, you have human beings in uh, prison. Yeah. And uh, wherever there are human beings, uh, restrictions are not likely to be watertight. Yeah. And uh, there are various ways of getting us in well informed. And we exploited those. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, uh, when sometimes we would be lucky to work uh, not very far from a dump, a rubbish dump. Yeah. And of course, it can be gold. You can find gold, a lot of gold there, uh, uh, newspapers. Yeah, right. And, uh, and then uh, when uh, on such days, we used to accumulate a lot of information yeah. by cutting the newspapers. And what was uh, Winnie's uh, fate at that time? Well, uh, Winnie has undergone a great deal of harassment on the part of the government. So much so that uh, there were certain moments when I wondered whether I had taken the correct decision of uh, getting committed. Uh, to the struggle. But uh, I would have uh, these hesitations, uh, but at the end of agitation within myself of reflection, I would, at the end of agitation within myself of reflection, I would feel that I had taken the right decision. But it's not easy to see your wife uh, being harassed uh, in the way in which she was. Uh, 
uh, uh, persecuted by the government. They they hounded her out of jobs, didn't they? Oh, that's when what they did. Had the job, they would see that yes. she lost it. Yes, quite. That's what they did. Yeah. She was um, a social worker by training. Yeah. And working in Paragonath Hospital. She then uh, took part in the anti apartheid campaign and was detained for 15 days in prison. She really? lost her job. Yeah. She then got to work from the, with the Child Welfare Society, which uh, is a government agency. Mm -hmm. uh, she lost her job. Then uh, she went to, you know, for various commercial enterprises. She was hunted up out of those jobs. And for a while you could get letters from the from her and from you could communicate more often. Was that the case? No. At first, as I said, I could communicate with her every six months. Yeah. Write one letter to her and received a letter from her. That was the only letter that was yeah. allowed. Then later, the period was reduced to three months, and later, at a month. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also the number, your quota of, of outgoing and incoming letters was increased and until you could write five letters a month. I've read some of those letters and it's uh, striking that uh, you're still, even though you're under a life sentence and in prison, you're still acting as the father of this family, if not the father of a very extended family, giving advice to relatives and uh, having them ask you for money, which seemed to be slightly absurd, but <laughs> well, uh, they seem to take it for granted. One must, uh, of course, remember that uh, our society is that of extended families. The clan is a very important family unit. Uh, people who claim a common ancestry, they will have different surnames, but uh, all are uh, coming down from one ancestor. Uh, the, and we look, uh, we regard all members of this, that clan as members of a family. You know, some of those letters uh, to the children and uh, the extended family sound like some Roman uh, father who's telling them... Uh, <laughs> how to uh, conduct a decent life. I have rarely seen such emphasis on good behavior and uh, uh, getting a good education, applying themselves to their studies and so on. It's a very conservative father. Well, uh, I would consider that because uh, having gone to jail when uh, my... Uh, eldest daughter was 18 months. Uh, I always saw them as babies. Yeah. Even after they had started visiting me now, after they had turned 16. And uh, although I noticed at times that they rebelled against uh, this type of treatment, they were very devoted and uh, uh, the children who loved me very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could see sometimes, you know, from the suppressed smiles, you know, when I said something, that uh, the gap between the two of us, you see, was widening. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I thought uh, it was my duty to try and help them, you know, through, I mean, the, through letters, to try and help them to face the problems of life. Sometimes, you see, I would be right, but there are many times when I would say things, you see, which were completely now out of context, you see, with the new uh, values which uh, applied amongst our people. See, the irony there is that uh, the regime is espousing family values, of course. The regime is saying that they want a conservative family at the rock bottom of the uh, society. 
and uh, here they are destroying yours. Yes, well, some of them did so, but uh, other commanding officers were very keen to preserve family ties. They were. <clears throat> and one of the first things that struck me was uh, an incident about my letters. My wife did not write to me for about six months. And uh, she came, she paid me a visit one day, and she said, why are you not writing to me? So I said, but I've been writing to you every month. She says, no, I've not received a letter from you for the last six months. I said, but I'm the person who should be complaining because I haven't received letters from you for six months. And um, so she then asked what is called the head of prison, the person, you know, who is in contact with us on a daily basis, asked her. Uh, my husband tells me that uh, he hasn't received my letters and I've received no letters from him. And this was a very irresponsible fellow. I was said, no, your wife, your husband is writing to other women, not to you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, my wife had already, of course, told me that she had been writing to me for six months, uh, every month, mm -hmm. over the last six months. And I raised the matter with uh, Colonel Vess, uh, what you call uh, Willems, uh, as he then was. And he says, I'm going to go into, into the matter. The next morning he called me and he says, here are your six letters. And, uh, and he says, uh, letters to your wife have also been posted. From now on, you'll have no trouble of this nature. Mm -hmm. I insist that the regulations must be carried out as they are. At some point, you had to believe that you would never live to get out of this place. Did that point ever arrive? Did you ever come to conclude that it was a hopeless case? What I can tell you is that um, the demand for our release from our people and uh, from important personalities and organizations inside and outside the country uh, became so insistent that our morale was, very, was raised. And we reached a stage when we believed that we would never die, die in jail. And then, of course, when you are a political prisoner and uh, there is growing support for the ideas uh, for which you are now suffering, you uh, are immediately uh, uh, put in a, on a level uh, where hope becomes very strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, we reached that moment as political prisoners when we felt that uh, uh, the government had failed in its attempt uh, to cut us out of the world and to make our people in the world have to forget about us. Uh, that message that uh, you have a role to play outside prison came through prison walls very strong and very clearly. You never felt you were forgotten? Not really. No. Uh, because uh, right from the beginning, when we went to prison, we had conducted our defense in such a way that uh, it had made a terrific, we had made a terrific impact uh, inside and outside the country. And uh, although the government was able to send us to prison, we felt that uh, we were the victors and the government were the losers. In our plea, we really put them against the wall, but they had the power uh, to send us to prison, and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. But on the moral issues, we felt uh, that we had come out stronger and that we were victorious. Now, that uh, uh, feeling remained with us uh, throughout the 27 years. The certainty of final victory was always there. Mm -hmm. Of course, I became uh, sometimes very angry when uh, I thought about the persecution of my wife and uh, that I could not uh, give her uh, the support yeah. 
which uh, she uh, needed. Uh, I felt uh, powerless. And also my children, you know, were hounded uh, out by the government. Uh, they uh, went uh, to an Indian school. They were expelled from there because of uh, government pressure. They went to a colored school, the same thing happened. And eventually we had to send them to Switzerland because uh, many black schools would uh, hesitate to take them. So you were really, they were really ostracized everywhere? Yes. Yeah. Yesterday I was uh, busy with a house-to-house -house campaign and uh, many things my wife didn't uh, tell me. I reached a house uh, in front of uh, my old house and the lady of the house there told me things which really moved me because um, I didn't behave appropriately after my release because if I had known what she told me, <clears throat> I would certainly have gone to thank her. She told me uh, of occasions when my wife was detained, that she was looking after my children. <clears throat> and uh, she said, well, I was very keen that uh, I should keep them in the atmosphere, in the homely atmosphere where they were born and grew up. And uh, instead of taking them to come and uh, stay in my house, I would go to your house during the day and look after them there, and then also sleep there. Uh, so that they should feel that uh, they are at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was hearing this for the first time. Mm -hmm. People generally expect a revolutionary to look angry and bitter and to sound uh, as though he's filled with vengeance. Uh, and you sounded uh, as though you had been uh, a stranger to bitterness. You have become a signal to the world that uh, the human spirit can triumph. And I think that's probably why so many people have such various opinions about race and about South Africa uh, came to respect you. Uh, I'm here for that, for the reason of saluting you, but also because uh, I think that a successful non-racial state in South Africa can ripple out all over the world. Uh, it can have effects in Detroit, London, Chicago, New York, as well as in Israel, and Africa, the whole world. I think a lot of us are depending, whether we know it or not, on the success of democracy in this part of the world. If it fails, uh, I think we will be in bad trouble in many places, and not just here. I believe that uh, the government is serious in wanting a democrat to bring about a democratic changes in the country. What has created serious doubts to us is their inability to carry out their duties of maintaining law and order. And uh, from the facts, it is clear that um, they have either lost control over their security forces or certain elements of their security forces. Or those elements are doing precisely what the government wants. And I understand that there are now in South Africa groups of men who are of no particular political interest or allegiance who are simply out as gangsters, you might say, who are preying upon people in order to gain a foothold and create a kind of little Thief, fiefdom or barony that they can exercise power from. That element is definitely there. That is no doubt. Well, this is the end. But uh, there is also an organized an element which is organized by the security forces themselves. Yeah, but if they think that they're going to control this all the time, they may be in for a surprise. That is true. 
But uh, you are dealing with men who not, do not necessarily have a dream, a vision of the future, who can't take a long term yeah. uh, look into the problems. They are concerned with the immediate issue, and the immediate issue is uh, to weaken the ANC and also to destabilize the peace process. That is what is happening. And uh, when you discuss with uh, Mr. de Klerk, he seems to have a, a sense of shock. Unlike others, he, as well as Minister Kobe could say, when you bring these matters to them, you can see a sense of genuine shock on their part. But then they do not follow up by taking measures to deal with this situation. And uh, I have gone to Mr. de Klerk and I said, in these areas, here are the names of the police officers against whom our people are complaining. They say these are thugs. These are the people under whom the security forces have killed many of our people. Remove them. In not a single instance has Mr. Tiglaka acted. Is there a, I've, I've heard uh, once or twice since I've been here, all of a week, that they want Nelson Mandela to make a clear statement of the future, of what he envisage, envisages for South Africa uh, as the future approaches. We have published the Freedom of Charter, which contains our basic policy. We have set out very clearly our vision of the future South Africa. We say all people shall govern, and no government which does not derive authority from the masses of the people will be allowed to exist. We say that um, all organs of government will be fully democratic. They will be determined through the votes of the masses of the people. That all population groups will be equal before the law. And that all forms of racialism will be banned. That uh, in the public sector, there will be no concession whatsoever to ethnicity. But each population group will be entitled to retain its culture, its language, its own schools, its own religious system. There will be a Bill of Rights in which the rights of every individual will be set out. That Bill of Rights will be entrenched through access to an independent judiciary. Anybody who feels that his rights are threatened or actually violated will be able to get relief from an independent judiciary. That is our vision of a future society. Well, I think that's clear enough. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ada. It has been a pleasure. Yes. What's the rest of your evening? I hope well, you go to sleep. No, no, no. I'm not going to sleep. I've got an engagement tomorrow. And that is why.